Yeah, I'm okay. So, um, could you first um, introduce yourself, like who you are, and give a background info? Okay, so my name is Dean Santos. I'm 23 years old. Um, I come from the Philippines, from Manila. And I moved to this country when I was uh, 12. And uh, I'm currently a student at Notre Dame de Namur University. I'll be graduating next year. I'm a political science major. And I'm also very active in the immigrant rights movement. All right. And then, uh, just okay. So, um, growing up in the Philippines was pretty uneventful. It's, I don't really remember that much, I guess, other than like little memories here and there. Um, it's not like something that I think about, so, but although I do remember being relatively comfortable when I lived there, because I lived in uh, Manila, it's the city, mm -hmm. so um, I lived a pretty normal life, I think, so that yeah, was... So what were your friends like back in the Philippines? Mm. Well, my friends, the thing is like most of my friends come from school and I went to a Catholic school over there and like we didn't really live nearby each other but like the folks who did, uh, like my friends I mm -hmm. um, kind of hung out with when I was younger um, that lived in the neighborhood um, like I usually you just, just see them during the summers because like summers are like the only time I actually get to go out and do stuff because I usually just stay in during school uh, school years. But um, I, well, now I kind of remember now like we did. I, I remember having fun like playing with little BB guns and we like shoot the crap out of each other. So we did have like t groups of like twenty like forty kids like about between the ages of like seven to like eleven with little BB guns and you know we'd all have our like little BB gun fight it's a, it's it's pretty fun actually and it usually happened on Saturdays like in the afternoon so like when that happens basically the whole block just gets crowded with like a bunch of kids and you just see like a bunch of like little BB shooting like flying all over the place and uh, it gets bloody sometimes because like people get hit and like oh. some of the BB guns there are pretty powerful and it, it breaks skin. So I remember one time there's a kid who got shot right here and we didn't wear any eye gear too, which is like, in hindsight, that's not a very smart thing to do, but we did do stupid things when we were kids. Right. But I guess I got one memory that I have, I guess. Mm. That was fun. Okay, so can you describe your experience um, the day of and like maybe the days leading up to uh, you moving to America? Okay, so that was pretty uneventful too, to be honest with you, because I didn't know that I was moving to the U.S. until like basically like three months before I actually moved here. And um, that was around the time where I think um, I finished elementary school. So um, basically like right before, or right before I finished elementary, my mom's like, oh, you're coming with me when I come back. Because my mom was already working here in the U.S. Oh, okay. And, you know, I thought, I was like, oh, cool, that sounds fun. And she's like, we're going to Disneyland. It's like, oh, that's even more cool, I guess. But, like, the days leading up to leaving was... Now, I remember telling my friends, hey, I'm moving to the U.S. I don't know if I'm be ever co uh, I'll be coming back. And that was not, like, as hard as I thought it would be. Well, it is kind of hard because like you're moving to a new place and you know, you don't know what, it, and I, I didn't know what it's like to be in the United States and <clears throat> I, I won't have any friends. But um, like, I didn't really think much about it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, although, looking back at it, it's like, I don't really think much about it anymore, so I don't know. So could you describe um, maybe like some of your first experiences of like living in the U.S. and what it was, what it was like moving here when you first came here? Wait, what do you mean? So basically like um, 
the hardships that you like the things that it was hard for you to adjust to and oh. kind of like well uh, in terms of like kind of adjusting to the lifestyle here um, I'd, say, I'd definitely say that was hard because like I remember the first two years it was like hardest for me because like I'd get homesick and you know and my mom or you know I tell my mom, I want to go back. My mom's like, no, 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 you're staying here. You're, you'd have a better future here. And, you know, the, the first few months wasn't that bad because, like, yeah, I had many friends here when I moved here. I didn't, there's not a big Filipino community in San Bruno, I would say. And my, friend, my mom didn't really have that much Filipino friends, so I didn't have any, um, like, Filipino friends, like, when I moved here until, I didn't really have any friends until, I started middle school and you know like the months leading up to moving or going to middle school was well it was all right like I ended up playing video games all day so and we had to read comics from the library uh, but that's kind of like my way of kind of like easing into the language I guess because I learned English or uh, when I was in the Philippines my mom started teaching me English when I was six so, when I started middle school, <clears throat> I didn't really do an, any ESL classes. Like, I was just placed on regular English. And <clears throat> I made friends pretty quick because, like, um, I remember there was a part of uh, the school where a bunch of kids would play Magic the Gathering, that little that card, the game. card game. Yes. And I still play it. I'm not ashamed of it anymore. I don't care. Um, and a bunch of women would be playing it, and I, ha I know how to play it. So, you know, first thing I know is like, oh cool, those guys are playing Magic. So I go up to them, and I started hanging out with them, and they, they became my friends. Basically, the end of the day, I ended up walking home with one of the folks that I met that my first day. So, like, that's like the thing that kind of helped me ease in, is through Magic the Gathering, where I got folks to play with, and I got um, I had friends who kind of lived pretty close by to where I live for the most part, so that was that was it. That was cool. All right. Okay. And then I see the paper. Oh, here. Just talk to me because I get. Sorry. Um. So. Can you tell me a little bit about your life now in the U.S.? Like, no. um. So, like how your life is different from now than it was um, when you first moved here? Oh, definitely. Um, my life is a whole lot different now. I didn't really think I'd, I'd be where I am now, coming, like, looking back at it. Um, back then, I didn't really know what I wanted, but I, did, I didn't know that I wanted to do politics, like, at a young age, because I remember watching a lot of news and seeing all the corruption in the Philippines, and it's always on the news. And whenever my mom would ask me, hey, well, what, if you go to college, what would you want to study? And I'm, I always tell them political science. And I didn't know why I said political science, but I do know that I wanted to study politics. So that I'm doing now, so that's kind of cool, but I never thought I'd end up in um, Notre Dame de Namur University, because I thought I'd like back then, I thought I'd probably end up with a skate, state school because it's cheap, and you know, I don't. My parents don't really have that kind of money to put me through a UC system, <clears throat> but I got lucky because Notre Dame gave me a fatty scholarship, so that was that was awesome. And uh, one big difference that I have now is like I'm very active in politics. Well, in with immigration, in with regards to immigration reform. Uh, I never thought that I'd be going on lobby visits uh, with senators and congressmen and congresswomen, and I never thought I'd go up to Sacramento to go lobbying for certain bills, advocate for folks in immigration, and I never thought I'd be yelling and yelling at Obama. I don't know if you saw the news, but yes, I did that too. Um, so. <clears throat> never thought I'd ever be that close to a president either, so. Um, yeah, so if you watch the news, there you remember the heckler that yelled at Obama? I'm the guy next to the guy that heckled at him. 
So, yeah, look it up. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So, how has been being an undocumented citizen affected your daily life here in the U.S.? I'm not a citizen. <laughs> or, sorry. How? <laughs> oh, there's stuff for me. Yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. but, yes, um, being undocumented uh, has been tough because I found out from basically the like three days after I came to this country my mom basically told me what our immigration status is well she didn't really say it implicitly but she did say that if somebody asked me a question that I just tell people that I'm a resident at the time it didn't seem such a big deal because oh okay I'll be doing that and she told me oh you'll be telling a white lie but it's for it's good for you you're not hurting anybody so I followed to that like whenever my friends ask me, oh, how? it's like, how'd you get here? It's like, oh, I'm a resident, you know, blah, 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 blah. Basically tell the same thing to my friends over, over and over. And nobody really asked the questions, so yeah. Um, but it does affect with your mentality because um, I remember while in high school, that's when it kind of hits me because like I didn't know if I could actually go to college or not and I was too scared to ask. Like, I thought if I asked somebody, I might get deported or something. So I never asked. And I never told any of my friends. So it's like something that I kept within me for the whole time throughout my high school years, throughout my middle school years, and I never told anybody. And there's not something that I talked about. And, um, you know, you kind of just pull it in and repress it, like put it in the back of your head and try not to think about it, but it, 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 it eats you up from the inside in a way. And that changed for the most part when uh, I became active, when I started coming, or we call it coming out of the shadows. It's um, kind of taken from the LGBT community where coming out is seen as a form of empowerment, right? Mm -hmm. So you kind of like, it's a, pro it's a hard process for me too because like coming out kind of basically you're not afraid anymore of what others think about your status. That you just come out with it, so you just say, I'm undocumented. And our motto is undocumented, unafraid. I'm undocumented, I'm not afraid anymore. I'm gonna speak up. It's a form of empowerment. That's like, that's how, and we start sharing our stories. And that's like one thing that was uncomfortable in the beginning too, was sharing my story. But hearing other undocumented kids share their stories is empowering in itself, because when you hear somebody speak and talk about their struggles and what they've gone through, uh, gone through kind of start realizing, <clears throat> you know, that, oh wait, that's me too. That's my story. Your story is the same as mine. And, the more, you know, sharing that kind of like makes you realize, like, hey, like, I can do this. And that's like kind of how eased into becoming comfortable with who I am. And that's like... It didn't make the struggles go away, but like it made me empowered enough to the point where I know where I stand and I know what I can do within my power to change anything if I can. So were you ever afraid of applying for jobs? Mm, no, not really, because I've, I've, I've been working since I'm, I was 15 and I've never applied for a job. The jobs always came to me. So... My first job was at a local deli where, because I hang out with uh, the local kids and they work at the same deli and it just, basically the owner just comes up to me and goes, and it's like the end of my freshman year and he goes, hey, you want to you wanna come work for me over the summer? And I'm like, oh cool, I, I want to do that. Like, it's extra money, right? When you're yeah. offered a job, you, of course you take it and it's the summer. Like, if you're not, I'm not, I'm not doing summer school, so might as well make some money. So I did, I accepted it, and all the, at first I was kind of scared that he was going to ask for like any papers or whatnot, but he never asked for anything, because I, th I think it was just done under the table. So that worked out for me, and the second job that I had is like a, at a local bike shop, which was like a couple of blocks down, and that one was a little tougher, because I hang out, hang out at that bike shop a lot, and the that was where my friends worked too, so I hang out there and to the point where the um, the manager of the shop kind of realizes, he's like, hey Dean, you're, you're pretty smart, I want you to work here. And you're not like these two other guys, which was my friends, they're dumb as fuck. 
Um, and I'm like, oh, cool. Yeah. Like, but I can't work though, because you know, I just made up some lie saying that because I was worried about my status. So I had to turn it down. And it got to the point where I hang out there a lot because you know I, I'm a I'm an avid cyclist and I ride my bike a lot and. They let me use their tools for free, and you know I fix up my bike there for free, and I also get to work on them, and I just help them out here and there. And the owner just says, "Well, if you can't work here, how about you just work in certain hours, and we'll pay you in parts. It's like a trade, a barter." And um, to me that felt like a good deal because cycling is my passion, and I get free bike parts and bike stuff, and that worked out for me too. So. You know, like finding a job was not really hard for me because I never really applied. And the job that I have now kind of came from um, the manager that offered me a job. He worked at another um, uh, another company that basically dealt with bike parts. And when he graduated college, he hits me up and he says, "Hey, Dean, um, I'm leaving this job. Do you want to take my spot?" And I'm just like, "Sure." All right, just give uh, Mary a call. Mary's the vice president, and the head, you know, called the vice president, and they set up an interview, and you just, you just got the job. You got the, I got an interview, and I got the job. Okay. So yeah. So now I know you're part of Aspire. Um, so could you tell me a little bit about that and how um, it helps you, and maybe how it could help other undocumented Filipinos? Oh, Aspire. Aspire is a very interesting group. It's um, Aspire stands for Asian Students Promoting Immigrant Rights Through Education. It's a pan-Asian undocumented youth group that's uh, started out out of uh, San Francisco within inside the offices of um, Asian Law Caucus, which is now called Advancing Justice Asian Caucus, and they're based in Chinatown. And it started out when one of the lawyers, uh, lawyers uh, at call Asian Law Caucus ALC, the lawyers at ALC started coming across uh, dreamers, you know, undocumented youth who qualify for the Dream Act, and she started kind of coming across them, and she notices that like there's no support system for undocumented Asian Pacific Islander youth, because even though there are campus groups, but they're always dominated by Latinos for the most part, and being Asian, you're Pacific Islander, you're Filipino, what have you, immigration is not talked about in our communities. It's not something that you know Filipinos just talk about. And you know, if you're undocumented, you don't have any papers. You just don't say, "Oh, I don't have any papers," you know, because it's not well received within the API community. API is Asian Pacific Islander, so it's not like the Latino community where, "Oh, you're uh, I'm undocumented," and you're met with sympathy or empathy or whatnot. With the API community, you're usually met with like antagonism, and you're pretty much stigmatized for the most part. So it's hard to talk about immigration. So that lawyer creates like the safe space. She's like, okay, so why don't we get all of these undocumented people that I'm coming across with, put them all together in one room, have them talk about their struggles, be become a support group, and um, kind of like uh, teach them how to organize themselves. And from there, Aspire grew into an organization that advocates for immigrant rights and policies that affect immigration, and uh, just started growing from there. So, what's the second part of your question? Um, so, how has it like helped you build your community, and how can it like help maybe other undocumented Filipinos? Okay. So it helped. Um, it helped the community. No, how did it help you? Oh, how, how did it help me? Okay, it helped me by a lot by helping me become more. Um, it helped me by helping me become more comfortable about myself because being a Filipino with no papers, you know, you just get like a lot of self-loathing. You just like, oh, why did this happen to me? Uh, I hate my parents for getting me into this situation, which is a dangerous kind of thinking because, you know, my parents sacrificed a lot for me. I shouldn't be, you know demonizing them for their sacrifices and aspire me had to help me realize that that it's not my parents' fault, it's the system that's broken that let it that you know my parents do end up this way. So <clears throat> Aspire helped me become politically active, the Gaga. I got um, became educated within the policies uh, about immigration and the rights that I have as an undocumented person here in the United States. 
and it helped me come out of uh, the shadows, so to say. And <clears throat> it helped me become who I am now. Because if I didn't find a spire, I wouldn't be where I am now. And what we try to do is to get other undocumented people out of the shadows, or at least, not out of the shadows per se, but at least give them a support group. Because for the most part, most of the new members that we get, they're always just like, they're so gloomy. You know, and that, that, was, that, that was me at one point too, because at the point, you know, you're just like, ah, oh. it's like I don't have any papers, I can't do anything. I can't get, you know, I, you don't, you just, you just think you can't do anything. You feel like you're trapped. And when you find other undocumented people who's doing all these fantastic things, like I remember the first time I met other undocumented people, it was at Berkeley, and they're all at Berkeley, and they're all have, they all have freaking full rides, and I'm like, how the hell did they do that, right? So, you know, just meeting other undocumented API folks kind of like made me realize the, of what is possible for me as an individual, and made me help realize like what I can do for the immigrant community by putting in work for the immigration. And in terms of helping out undocumented Filipino immigrants, that's part of our mission as, a, as an organization is to help any Asian folks, because it's pan-Asian, it's like all Asians are welcome, and especially Filipinos. Like actually within our leadership, um, four out of six of our leaders are Filipinos. So it's not always been like that, but like there's a lot of Filipinos that are stepping up and taking leadership positions. And um, you know, um, there's a big uh, Filipino community here in the Bay Area. And what we try to do is like at least outreach to those communities, and uh, that's actually our plan. Uh, one of our plans within t for 2014 is to be more active with direct outreach. But uh, most of our membership usually come from uh, universities, not high schools, and that's our, our next step too. So. Okay. So how does being an undocumented immigrant in the U.S. affect the Filipino attitude of attaining citizenship and political empowerment? Can you repeat that? So how does, basically, I'm trying to say, um, how does, like, being an undocumented Filipino affect um, attaining your attitude towards attaining a citizenship and your political uh, empowerment? Well, of, of course... You know, being Philip undocumented, like the end goal, or at least what you want ultimately, is to become a citizen. But within the movement, like with the immigrant rights movement, there's folks who kind of oppose citizenship in some ways. Like, not as a personal choice, not, you know, for everybody else, just because of all the hardships that they've been through. It's like, I don't want citizenship, I just want to be treated as a regular human being. And that's where it all boils down to. And if, citizen, if citizenship, uh, citizenship is what that means, it's like, that's what we'll go for. But for me, of course I want citizenship. Um, and that's what we're fighting for with, uh, with immigration reform. Um, in terms of uh, political empowerment, there's a lot of um, benefits that comes with becoming a citizenship, and primarily that is the power of voting. And here in the United States, the fastest, largest growing um, immigrant group is the Asian Pacific Islander community. And that's mostly coming from South Asia, which is primarily India. And if Asian Pacific Islanders can come together and, you know, basically, um, what do you call it, like, use that voting power? Because that's what the Latinos are doing now is they're you know stretching that muscle of voting, and that's how California turned from a red state into a blue state. From uh, basically 1994, you got this anti-immigrant Prop 187 that targeted Latinos. What did that do? It forced folks that were legalized from 19, 1986 reform. There's like a big amnesty. The folks they weren't even planning on becoming citizens, but because they were under threat, they. A lot of folks mobilized to sit, um, to get those guys citizenships, and when they did, 
squeeze that muzzle, you know, you like flex that muscle, and California turned blue. So it's only a matter of time, like where Asians become like a powerful voting block, and it's not just necessarily Filipinos; it's just like all folks from Asia, for the most part. And you know, voting is powerful. Um, it can change things. As look at how it has changed California, mm -hmm. and it will change Texas. Mark my words, it will change Texas. Texas will turn blue um, in the next 20 years or so. So, and it's all, uh, you know, flexing that voting power. And, yeah. So now I know that you've told me before that you um, were about to be deported and were held in Arizona or something like that. Yeah. And so my question is that, so after having that experience of um, the government wanting to deport you, how has that changed your attitude towards attaining citizenship? Well, it hasn't changed anything about attaining citizenship, but what it does made me uh, being, um, experiencing that process of, you know, going through deportation proceedings plus being detained and you know, getting wrapped up and getting sent to Florence, Arizona, to an immigration prison. It's a federal prison that's like in the middle of nowhere. Um, that was a traumatic experience. And it's a very painful experience. It's very, um, you just get this like sense of fear and uncertainty and you don't know what to do. And there were a lot of folks that I met, you know, that were fighting their cases. And I was fighting my case, you know, to be able to stay here. And there's a lot of folks who are fighting their cases to be with their daughters and their sons and their family, right? And that made me realize that what deportations really do. It separates families. And going through the whole system made me realize of how broken the laws are, right? Because that's where it all boils down to. Because you have this um, finger, you know, it all boils down, boils down to like, um, when a, you know, when someone gets in contact with the police, right? So. Let's say there's a domestic dispute, right? One person, uh, you know, let's say the victim was um, undocumented, but when the police comes, you know, they get called in, oh, there's this couple fighting. They go in, they arrest both of them because they don't know who started it. Both of them gets fingerprinted. That fingerprinting um, program is called Secure Communities, ESCOM, and what it does is when uh, somebody, you know, that fingerprint is taken, that's sent to ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and immigration basically says, okay, hold this person for two days and we'll go come pick them up. So that's where the broken part is because like the folks that get caught into this system are usually folks with either no criminal, have either no criminal records or have low or minor offenses, right? So even though that fingerprinting system is like, it's called secure communities because it's uh, you know meant to target folks with violent or serious felonies, all, two thirds of the folks that get caught in it have either, you know, no, no convictions or have low level crimes, right? So, with all these record deportations that you have, it's mostly folks like with families too. But the recent report from uh, from Immigration and Customs Enforcement, um, the government has deported parents of, um, I think. The latest number was 205,000 U.S. citizen kids will grow up without a parent. So, yeah. All right. So now, like, reflecting upon, like, the time that you moved, when you, your time in the Philippines and your time here, what would you have done differently? I don't think I would have changed anything, I don't think. Because, you know, when we moved here, like, well, of course, preferably, I'd like to come here legally, but I don't think my parents have the means to do so. So, you know, I don't think I'll change that. Um, the experiences that I got, you know, all the suffering that I went through, all the struggles that I've gone through, it's made, I think it's helped me shape me for who I am now. And I don't think I'll trade that for anything. Because I'm pretty happy for where I am at now, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not changing anything. It's Everything's been pretty good so far. Although, well, I guess the one thing I'd change is I should have gotten better grades in high school. 
That's about it. Everyone wishes that. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> but other than that, like, yeah, that's the only thing I was doing, but that's like, that's not, I don't think that kind of goes along with like moving here and all of that, but. So, would you say that you feel like you're living a better life here now than you were back in the Philippines? Well, of course, because I feel like I've gotten, I've gotten a very good education here. Um, <clears throat> I've got a lot of great teachers. Um, I had really good friends. I've had a really good community that supports me. Um, basically, I wouldn't be here right now if the people from where I'm from, San Bruno, would have not supported me, or if the the shout out to um, shout out to the social science department of Skyline College. Without them, I wouldn't be here. So, um, you know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your time. All right. That's not too bad. <laughs>